So welcome to building a cloud stack UI for the enterprise. Um, my name is Bill Jones. This is Dave Presanti. We're both software engineers for SunGuard Availability Services Cloud Engineering Group. Um, I'm just going to give an overview. I think I'm supposed to stand here, actually. I'm going to give an overview of um, what we're going to talk about and go through uh, first um, sort of what SunGuard Availability Services, what the Cloud Engineering Group does. Um, then we're going to talk about our development effort. We built a, a UI on top of CloudStack to serve our customers as a cloud control panel, uh, sort of as an alternative, sort of a customer-focused version of the, um, the, the out-of-the-box CloudStack UI. We're going to talk a little bit about what's unique about our user interface, sort of what drove um, us to do that, some of the features, the technologies that we're using. Um, then I'm going to turn it over to Dave. He's going to go through the architecture um, integrating with CloudStack, some of the experience that we had there. And then we're going to have a short demo, show some of the features of the user interface, some of the things that drove us to choose the technologies that we chose. And um, then we're going to, if we have time, talk a little bit about continuous integration and sort of how we integrated that into our process. So SunGuard Availability Services um, is, well, I, I guess I have to talk a little bit about SunGuard because that's where I work, and I think they expect that. So I'm not going to read through this. SunGuard's a great company. We have great services. Um, you should all use us. <laughs> Especially the cloud. Especially the cloud. So currently, SunGuard has a cloud offering um, called Enterprise Cloud Services. It's a shared multi-tenant infrastructure. Um, it's a fully managed infrastructure. It is not a self-service infrastructure. It's geared more towards customers that are trying to move their existing IT workloads into the cloud, into the quote-unquote cloud. Um, it gives them um, a lot of the flexibility of uh, a cloud economic model, but it also um, provides them with um, the sort of full service that, that a traditional operations, IT operations group would would provide. So what we're missing, though, or what we were missing and what we're, what we're building is more of a public cloud type of an offering, something that provides a self-service model for our customers that allows them to um, sort of manage their infrastructure themselves. It's primarily geared towards um, scenarios for development and test as opposed to production. Our current environment is more of a production support type of a, um, an offering. So we thought about offering um, public cloud on top of our existing infrastructure, but it really wasn't built for that. And in addition, um, we, we work, or our existing infrastructure is pretty much homegrown. It's, it's all sort of custom built. Um, and we thought that there might be a, a better way to do that. So as we re-architected things, we chose CloudStack um, and significantly simplified sort of our, our underlying hardware architecture, um, and also you know, get the ability to leverage the open source community and you know, all the great work that CloudStack's doing. So a little bit about why we chose CloudStack. Um, we're growing, uh, so scalability, scaling. Our development group was a concern. Um, also, uh, the flexibility and customization that um, that a self-service offering would provide. Uh, improving the, the, the reliability of our provisioning automa automation. Um, there's been a lot of, uh, I guess, advances in technology since we built our original cloud platform three years ago. And so we wanted to sort of start from, start from scratch and leverage sort of the best in the industry. So what UI do we offer our customers? There's a few um, driving features or driving factors behind um, sort of how we built this UI. First of all, certainly self-service. Um, we wanted um, customers to be able to sort of sign up by themselves and manage their own infrastructure completely. Uh, utility billing, the billing model that we, that we have for our existing cloud service is, is not a utility billing model. Um, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not a utility billing I don't really want to talk about it. but. Um, what we did want to provide is wanted to provide pay-as-you-go uh, type of service so that you only pay for what you use. 
And finally, this, one, of the, one of the real uh, driving factors for us was the ability to provide cost control. So for a lot of customers, when they use uh, a self-serve sort of utility billing model and roll that out to their to the internal groups, there's no way for them to really manage the costs associated with that. So one of, one of, a lot of the features that we're building into our user interface allow for cost control, chargeback, and reporting so that there can be some um, administrative management control over um, how, how, these, how the, spend, um, the spend associated with the cloud infrastructure. And then finally, um, we wanted to make it very easy to use. Um, our existing user interface for our, our ECS and for a lot of the, the um, well, the, the existing cloud stack UI, it's not exactly geared towards end users. So we wanted to provide something that was simple, something that um, provided a lot of functionality but didn't require training and was intuitive to use. So some of the things that we do that are a little bit different than the, the, existing, cloud, um, the existing cloud stack administrative console, we provide real-time notifications. Uh, the existing um, cloud stack UI actually relies on polling, and it polls the cloud stack management server. Um, we wanted to provide something that was a little more responsive. So we, to do that, we integrate with the RabbitMQ event bus, which was new. I think it was new in 4.1, but sort of more uh, robust in 4.2. We also um, wanted to provide our end users with the ability to do things that the standard cloud stack um, permissions model only gives root admin users to do. So without exposing the root admin capability, we wanted to, for example, give um, authorized users within our UI the ability to create, new, to create new users, which in the standard model is only allowed for the root admin. So we also provide roles that are more business-centric. So as opposed to just the domain admin, admin, and root admin, um, we have a number of, of business-centric roles that we're building in um, for billing administration, for um, administrative management, for systems administrators, and then for um, uh, lower-privileged systems administrators. But provide something that's a little more um, aligned with our customers' actual requirements. And then finally, uh, again, I mentioned one of the big uh, driving features for us was cost control. So we uh, actually took the, the, it, the concept of the cloud stack project and expanded that somewhat into something what, that we call a workplace. And a workplace is a cloud stack project, but it also includes the ability to assign budgets um, so that you can get notifications when the spend in that workplace or when the, the cost associated with that workplace exceeds certain thresholds. And that gives it, um, the administrative management the ability to, um, to understand sort of how things how costs are going and to control costs within their organization. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. He's going to talk about the technical. Can aspects. you guys hear me? Mike is good. OK, so I'm going to take over from Bill and give you guys a description of the components that we've built and the components that we're integrating with for CloudStack. This is kind of a, a fun or a picture than just boxes with words. Um, so start on the left-hand side. Um, with the client or the browser, so um, Chrome, Firefox, Internet Explorer, if you're so inclined with, to use that. Um, and that's made up of a few components, the Twitter bootstrap framework, uh, Backbone.js, and Marinette.js for JavaScript, and Sock.js for WebSockets. In the bottom left-hand corner is an OpenID server that we're using for single sign-on. That's integrating with um, something that SunGuard currently uses, and that way users don't have to you know, remember another username and password. So the client and the browser basically makes two connections back to our server. One is to a Ruby on Rails app um, that we're building, and the other is to a Node.js app um, that we're calling Hermes. So let's concentrate on the Rails app first. So all the interaction with the browser that the user does, filling out forms, clicking buttons, all that stuff is posted back to the, to the Rails app, and it's responsible for figuring out um, which calls need to go to CloudStack or which calls need to go to a set of billing integration APIs um, that we're building internally as well that are on top of some Oracle systems. And that handles setting up customers' accounts and, and for the utility billing stuff that Bill mentioned a little later. And then the one other component that we're talking to is a, a Redis uh, backend data store. And I'm going to talk about that a little later, but 
essentially we're using that to store information about any of the async jobs that we call in CloudSec. So we're storing the job ID along with all of the request parameters for all the async jobs. Then lastly, the other connection is back to a WebSocket connection back to the Node.js app. And we use that to funnel those real-time events that Bill mentioned earlier up to the user. So we are subscribing to the RabbitMQ process that CloudSec publishes events to um, with the worker process that we call bunny ears, and that's written in Ruby. And it's responsible for parsing each of the messages, determining if it's relevant to us, potentially looking up more data within CloudStack, and potentially write us for the async jobs, sending that back up to Hermes via an HTTP post, and then Hermes basically decides if, or not decides if, but which users that data may be relevant to, and then sends it back up to the browser. So I'm going to talk about each of the pieces a little bit more. So the worker process, like I said earlier, is um, called Bunny Ears. It's written in Ruby. We're using a Ruby gem called Bunny, which is where the name Bunny Ears came from. Um, and then Ruby on, the web app is Ruby on Rails um, that's running under Nginx and Unicorn. The Node.js app is Node.js, obviously, but it's using a framework called Primus for the uh, WebSocket server. Um, and the one interesting thing about the Hermes app is it's really small. It's like 140 lines of code. It's not doing very much, just handling those, those posts from bunny ears and then sending, sending stuff up to, the, up to the user. And then Backbone and Marionette are handling all the UI changes in the browser, particularly when the um, events come up through the WebSocket connection. It's responsible for basically redrawing all of the stuff on the screen you know, when resources change or when new VMs pop up, et cetera. And I think a lot of this stuff is all theoretical now, but it'll be, it'll be helpful when we show the demo. You can kind of see how, how all, all of it works. Um, and then Redis, using it, that for the async job storage correlation, and then we're also using it for user invitations. Um, unrelated to CloudSec, but that way we give the users the ability to invite more people, and then we're keeping track of the invites that way. And then lastly, just the, the bootstrap, sort of bootstrap framework. So the one thing we definitely wanted to talk about in our talk at the conference was our experience using the API and the event bus, both good and, and bad. Um, <clears throat> so the obviously benefits, fully featured API is, is really great. You know, there's no secret sauce inside the orchestration layer that we, that we necessarily don't have access to. So we can you know, do everything through the API that the CloudStack UI is doing. And async jobs are also really, really great instead of you know, making the user have to wait for synchronous things to finish and creating a VM. And we're wrapping some of that in the job management stuff that I mentioned earlier. So as with anything that people use a lot, you kind of notice more problems as you're using them. So some of the areas that we've been kind of eyeing for improvement and things that SunGuard's trying to help improve with the community are a better permissions model, which is actually something that's already in progress, um, a truly RESTful interface to the API, and then just more consistency around the requests and responses through the API. So most of it's not big deals, but just little things like when you list SSH key pairs, you say SSH key pairs, and when it replies, it says SSH key, SSH key pair, singular. So it's just little things that you're not expecting when you first, first start using it. And this is kind of our, our a little poke that we were tempted not to put in there, but we figured it would be fun to throw it up there. So <clears throat> some of the developers that we're working with had never worked with CloudStack before. So they were just you know, making API calls. Um, so they're, one of the user stories that we tried to implement at the beginning was um, updating a port forwarding rule, which you can't do, but they didn't know that. So when they were trying to do it, they were like, well, I'm getting a job ID back and everything says that it's working, but it's not, it's not. So like, we opened up the code and it was like, what, what is this? So it says that it works, but it doesn't really because it's just coming through. Um, so the event bus stuff, as we mentioned, we're using RabbitMQ. When we originally started working on the project, we were actually using Cloud Platform 306, which didn't have the event um, bus functionality, and we were just polling, um, and we noticed really quickly that that was not gonna scale. It was a pain for um, user acceptance testing and automated tests. So we were really happy once we moved to 4.2 and were able to, to integrate that. So that's been really helpful. And then, along the same lines of the API, some areas that we've been trying to help contribute back to is the different types of events were kind of confusing at first, like action events, usage events, resource state changes events, async job events, just 
data was kind of spread across multiple places. So trying to figure out which ones were appropriate for all of our use cases took us a little bit of time. Um, and sometimes it was data in some of the events related to projects that were unique IDs that were internal to the database that you couldn't really use to list stuff. Um, so in one specific case for async jobs, we committed something back that added the project ID to async jobs for projects so that way you could, you know, once you get that data back, it's easier to, to look up what project it was relevant for. So this is just to kind of circle back and look at what the full architecture looks like after I explained all of it. So um, no surprises here. I just wanted to throw it back up there so you can see. Um, so we're going to move on to the demo. Do you want to do the demo? You want me to do the demo? Yeah. Okay. Um, you can just play it and we can yeah. talk through it, I guess. Okay, so pre-canned. We, we were going to do a live demo, but we were a little nervous. Hopefully this works. <laughs> okay, why don't we set it up first and then we'll... So what we're looking at here is the, the workplace dashboard where we show um, what all the virtual resource, resources in your project slash workplace are. Um, and we're going to just walk through the creation of a VM and show the flow of that to show how we tried to improve the user experience around creating a virtual machine. And it looks so, yeah, you can see it. So you click new virtual machine, enter the host name and the description, select the service offering, it's going kind of quickly. Oh, um, do you want to, can you pause it? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I've done this like 16 times a day, so it's yeah. kind of flying through. So it's a little bit hard to scroll, we sort of went past it, but the first thing that you select is you select your template or your operating system. Um, the next thing, and here we have them grouped by, we have the templates grouped by operating system. In this case, it's a development system, so there's not a lot of, um, lot of, lot of, lot of artifacts there yet. The next, you select your compute offering, but instead of selecting a compute offering in the way that CloudStack presents it, we actually break it down so that you can, so from a customer perspective, you can select how many CPUs do I want and then how much memory do I want. You don't have to look at them together. And we think we have a, a nice sort of a flow here to, um, to make that sort of easy to understand. And then if you play again. I was gonna say the one thing too, the last thing is we don't have any of the billing integration in oh, these screenshots yeah. now, but eventually you'll see a price here and it'll change based on what service offering you're picking. And then finally you select your network and your SSH, or actually your authentication mechanism. Again, I'm sorry it was going so fast. But at the end, you get the root password back in a, in a, um, in a modal display, which is not saved anywhere except no. the CloudStack database. We don't save it anyway. We don't save it. Okay, so that's the end of that one, and move on to the next one. So the next one we're trying to, we're trying to this demo is, is to just display sort of the real-time notifications and sort of how the user interface updates. Um, so we have two workplaces here, or actually we have two views of the same workplace. Imagine that you have one user at one desktop and another user at another desktop, and they're both working in the same workplace. Um, one user goes and adds a virtual machine, and what we're showing here is that all of the, all of the views update simultaneously. <coughs> so it's gonna look similar to the other one. Until I started typing. Select the service offering. In this case, we're gonna use an SSH key pair instead of a root password. And you can see down here, it was kind of fast, but this, like this browser changed. Let me go back. The, the VM down here showed up after we clicked the create. So we're just showing that the, the events are kind of going to both browsers at the same time. And we'll drill into a little bit more. We went to the, you know, the top browser, to the VM, we're stopping it. The stopping is actually pretty quick since we're using the simulator here. But you can notice down here that this, the status the changes. Status changes well. immediately. Okay, then lastly, this is uh, some just network configuration yeah. steps. I don't know if you want to, you, you might want to, you okay, might yeah. want to talk through this. So we, we kind of organized the network configuration into these tabs. Um, so you can kind of see everything all in line. So there's you know, public IPs, um, port forwarding, inbound, up on firewall rules, load balancing, and VPN configuration. So the first thing that I did was just you're adding an IP address to this network. And then the way that the events are working, it kind of popped up on the screen automatically. The next thing we're going to show is inbound firewall rules and how the UI is changing dynamically depending on if you pick TCP or ICMP uh, or UDP. So obviously ICMP rules have a code and a type 
whereas UDP and, and TCP rules only have start and end ports. So and then the, the user interface updates dynamically for that. And then the last thing was load balancing. So whatever actually gets there. So here we're going to go through the steps of creating a load balancer pool, give it a name, assign an IP address and a port range, and a policy. And then afterwards, add VMs to that load balancer pool. And again, our feeling is, our, our, our goal here is to make the functionality accessible to end users that, that are not necessarily um, experienced systems administrators, but, um, but understand the concepts. Okay. Technically, I think we have five minutes left. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed through the testing part as quick as possible, giving everyone the information. So the one thing that we wanted to talk about a little bit was testing and maybe logging if I have time. So obviously, testing, testing an application is hard in general. Um, so from the beginning when we started working on this, we wanted to try as hard as possible to do test-driven development with everything we're using. And we're doing an agile development method, doing weak sprints, so we've been pretty aggressive with, with the way that we've been working. Um, so let me, let me step back so you didn't see that. One of the items, or things that we in the beginning had a challenge with was we wanted to write user acceptance tests. User acceptance tests. So basically using a framework called Capybara and um, Poltergeist to do headless browser testing. So emulating an actual user clicking around in the browser every, you know, every code push that we do. So we actually you know, need to talk to a cloud stack somewhere. So in the beginning, we were like, okay, we'll just you know, use the simulator. And I don't know if it was just bad luck, and we picked use cases that made it really difficult. We just had like a ton of problems getting it to work correctly. It would fill up, since it's kind of acting as a real hypervisor. Um, so you know, just in terms of quickness, some of the guys that we're working with um, had some experience with VCR before, and that's a recording tool, obviously, from the name. But it allows you to record HTTP um, requests and then replay them. So we were basically using that as the endpoint. So we would you know, emulate what we were sending a HTTP request and then re respond with what we expected. And that was really great in the beginning. It was super fast. But it broke down once we integrated the event bus, because obviously VCR can't generate events to RabbitMQ. So our next um, effort was, <laughs> let's build a fake cloud stack. So along that lines, we basically built a Sinatra app that emulated what CloudStack would do, sending events, and we called it Smokestack. But that became too much work after a couple of weeks as well. We abandoned that and went back to the simulator and eventually figured out a way to get it to work, which I'll talk about in a second. One other thing I want to mention, we're using a tool called Code Climate for um, quality and security analysis, which is pretty cool. It gives us grades on our code and also just test coverage stuff. So we're using Jenkins for um, continuous integration, so running tests after each push, branches, and master. And the challenge that we had with the simulator was how many do we have? You know, do we have one per developer? Do we have some set of them in our lab that all the Jenkins tests are running against and the developers are running against? So we ended up settling on this idea of having a pool of CloudStack instances that the tests can ask for, you know, check out and then check in when they're done. And we're basically using that with a bare metal box with Vagrant and VirtualBox. So snapshotting each of the instances, and then the test will ask for them, run their tests, and then when they're done, when they check it back in, we'll just reset to the snapshot. And the VirtualBox actually does a really good job. It's like seconds between when we say it's you know, checked back in and when it's ready again for more tests. So this is just like a quick picture of what the simulator pool looks like, gives you status. Can, can I ask a quick question? Um, how many, are, is anybody in the audience familiar with the CloudStack simulator? Does anybody use it? Chip? Maybe I should, we should have talked about that. Um, okay. um, I'll give two seconds. So it basically allows you to have a, a fake hypervisor that instead of talking to any backend um, physical real hypervisors, it just puts entries in a database. But it still acts the same. It still runs through code and has a certain amount of RAM, has a certain amount of CPU, a certain amount of storage. So essentially, so, the simulated part is the, is the hypervisor. Yeah, the simulated part's the hypervisor. So you still have an issue with how many hosts does it have, how much memory does it have. So you can't just throw it there and say it'll last for the whole day. We did it in the beginning, but then as we got more developers and more tests, it just became really cumbersome. Where are we on time? Okay. Um, so Docker's like the new cool thing. 
So we did a little bit of a prototype to replace VirtualBox and Vagrant with Docker. It works pretty well. We just haven't had time to really integrate it in with the, with the pool. But I think it could be an interesting area of exploration. And lastly, um, the company that we're working with along with us built a, a Ruby client for CloudStack that's up on GitHub. It's cool. Everyone should check it out. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but it has a lot of interesting features. And also our, our Vagrant CloudStack simulator is up on GitHub as well. Um, we're using Graylog for logging. That's also good. Helps us a lot with tracing problems through the development environment when the app is really complicated. We're going from the UI to CloudStack, you know, from Rails to CloudStack, and all those events. So whenever we have tests that break, it was really hard to figure out where they were breaking. So a bunch of stuff in Graylog. Um, so lastly, just some acknowledgments. Obviously, we want to thank the CloudStack community for helping us out with everything, our employer. And PromptWorks uh, is the name of the um, Rails and Ruby shop in Philadelphia that we're working with. So obviously, they are doing a lot of work for us. So I wanted to throw their name up there as well. Then we'll go to questions. No, we're done early for no reason. I can keep talking. No <laughs> Sure. So I guess since we're using the single instance of CloudStack, single inst instance of the management server, and each customer is not getting their own, we can't give any one customer the root permissions. So I don't know how familiar you are with a permission model in CloudStack now, but if we gave it out to everyone, they could you know, delete other people's projects, delete other people's VMs. So we're creating a domain per company that would sign up, and then the highest level person in that company becomes a domain admin. Domain, domain admins don't have the ability to create accounts, other accounts. So what ends up happening is we have to act as root admin for them in order to create more accounts within their domain. So that's, that's probably the biggest example, I would say, of the elevated permissions. Um, there's a case where we, for, some, for a particular reason, we don't want users regenerating their API keys because we're storing them somewhere else. So we have to block that from letting users generate API keys as well. So we're making only root admin do that. Um, and in the future, some of our future plans are going to require a lot more fine-grained permissions. So I think we'd like to get away from doing that in the UI and push that, put that more into CloudStack. And there's actually a project going on that some of the folks at Citrix are working on that we're going to hopefully help with that'll make CloudStack more similar to AWS's IAM model. So groups and policies you know, on top of of accounts. Okay. Uh, do you export the uh, so the question was, I forgot to repeat the first one. Yeah. Do I, we export the console? Yes. So one of the things on Stacker B that we realized that we needed was the ability to get back what would be the console in the browser. So yeah, we, the Stacker B has a call, you know, I think console access it's called, and you still have to give it the API and secret key, and it gives you back the HTML source and we just throw that in a browser window. And that's how the console access is working. Soon to be an iframe. Soon to be an iframe. Now, right now, it's a new tab. Was there another question in the middle? Yeah, I was wondering if you're, well, you didn't talk about billing or usage tracking, but if you're planning on tracking at the user level or account level, how mm -hmm. do you handle the fact that contact is handled only at the account level? So the way that we're, not really exposing the users. Right now we're treating a user as an account. And we're actually not letting anyone create any account level resources. We're just gonna, in like mobile settings, we're gonna set max account, all those to zero, and we're gonna make everyone use a project. So all of the, all of the billing is gonna be at the project level, not at the individual account level. And that, some of the backend billing systems I showed in the initial picture, they're gonna pull the usage records you know, daily or twice a day, and then just bill based on that. Getting the big stop sign. Got the stop sign. <laughs> Should be red. No. Okay. Well, thanks, everyone. Thank you.